Thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. In today's video, we're going to look at how the political right uses a network of fake research institutes to shape the news. Doing so is going to involve touching upon a number of deeply important topics, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing conservative moral panic about critical race theory. But I want to start with a story that's altogether much stupider. It was a little over a month ago, and I'd just finished a long day of video editing, when I wandered into my living room, slumped down on the sofa, and more out of habit than any real enthusiasm, booted up the Twitter app on my phone. And on doing so, I was met by a tweet sharing this incredible headline. The moon should be privatised to help wipe out poverty on Earth, economists say. Just one more time in case you didn't catch that. The moon should be privatised to help wipe out poverty on Earth, economists say. The tweet was from the official account of The Independent, a British newspaper which occupies a similar-ish position in the editorial spectrum of UK media as The Guardian with the fun quirk of being partly owned by a Russian oligarch and allegedly part owned by the government of Saudi Arabia. The tweet linked to an article which detailed the publication of a new research paper written by an economist called Rebecca Lowe. The paper argues that with commercial ventures such as SpaceX, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin gaining momentum, along with plenty of other less high-profile initiatives, the time has come to establish a system through which individuals, and by extension corporations, can take ownership of portions of the moon, and use those patches of moon land to turn a profit. We'll return to the report itself in a moment, but back on Twitter, the Independent's tweet promoting the article had gone what I'd describe as very mildly viral. It wasn't exactly Will Smith slapping Chris Rock or the Crazy Frog or anything, but on the small corner of Twitter that my digital self calls home, this was absolutely the post of the day. The response was, to put it mildly, not positive. I scrolled for a long, long time while writing this, and the only responses to the tweet I could find that weren't completely savaging the idea of privatising the moon were from the report's author and someone who works for the organisation that published the document, both of whom did their best to hide their disappointment at having their proposal for renting the moon out to billionaires roundly rejected in the marketplace of ideas. In an interesting example of the weird relationship between social media and the traditional news media in the present day, this mild viral backlash meant that the report actually became a far bigger story than it had been previously. Prior to Twitter tearing into it, the only coverage that the research paper had received outside of that short write-up in The Independent had been from The Daily Star, a tabloid paper which tends to publish articles of a much lower brow variety. In the week following, however, every newspaper in the country, and some from further afield, seemingly wanted to weigh in on the debate surrounding moon ownership. Articles were published in The National, The Guardian, Time Out, The Tribune, The New Scientist, The Mary Sue, even Ben Shapiro's outlet, The Daily Wire, tried to catch some clicks from the affair. Like the responses to the tweet from The Independent that had first caught my attention, the various follow-up articles almost exclusively took a negative view of private moon ownership. The overwhelming feeling was that humanity's baby steps into outer space provide us with the opportunity to rethink how we organise our economy, and that it's a waste of that opportunity to let the same economic system which has laid waste to this planet add the moon to its body count. Ok, so why am I telling you this story, and what does any of this have to do with anything? Well, it would be very easy to interpret what I'm calling the privatising the moon affair as a sign of a media ecosystem in the rudest of health. 
To frame this as an example of a journalist engaging with cutting-edge research in order to facilitate healthy debate of a bold new economic proposal. But I want to suggest quite the opposite. Indeed, I would argue that the fact that this debate about privatising the moon was even had in the first place highlights a consistent and habitual failure of contemporary journalism. See, peppered throughout the tweets and newspaper articles responding to the research paper which sparked this whole conversation was the occasional bit of eye-rolling by more dedicated politics nerds at the organisation which had commissioned the report. For while that initial tweet from The Independent had credited the idea of privatising the moon simply to economists, reading further revealed the paper not to have been published in a peer-reviewed academic journal, but instead simply as a pamphlet by an organisation called the Adam Smith Institute. Such a name might conjure up images of an elite academic institution staffed by respected professors. And that's certainly the goal. In truth, however, the Adam Smith Institute is little more than a propaganda outfit. Deeply secretive about where its money comes from, the organisation's sole reason for existing is to churn out dubious papers and studies which give academic support to political policies which benefit large corporations and the super-rich. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, for example, the Adam Smith Institute came out in opposition to seizing the assets of Russian oligarchs, comparing the implementation of such sanctions by NATO-aligned countries to European Jews being forced to sell their property as they fled the Holocaust. Really classy stuff. The Adam Smith Institute is not alone in this line of work. It's one of many so-called think tanks which, over the past 50 years, have become an inescapable feature of formal politics. You've probably heard of some of these organisations. The Heritage Foundation, the Henry Jackson Society, the Institute of Economic Affairs. Bridging the gap between lobbying groups, PR firms and universities, think tanks exist across the political spectrum, but they've become a particularly favoured tactic of the political right who are both willing to be far more unscrupulous in dressing up pure propaganda as research and have far more money to spend in promoting their ideas. Wealthy libertarians such as Charles Koch and Betsy DeVos pump money into these faux academic institutions as a means to launder political policies and ideas which serve to reduce their tax bill and strip away any regulation which might impact the ability of their businesses to turn a profit. As we'll see throughout the rest of this video, the impact that these organisations have on our politics is immense. There are plenty of political policies in place today that would be unthinkable without these fake research institutes having helped to falsely portray them as being grounded in objective evidence. Some of the most familiar arguments in favour of conservative economic and social policies, assumed by many people to merely be common sense, are also the result of these organisations' propaganda efforts. It won't surprise long-term viewers of my channel, however, to learn that in order to truly understand how think tanks operate in the present day, I think we need to briefly look at where they came from. Because it's only through doing so that one can begin to comprehend the deeply weird, yet highly influential, position that these fake experts occupy in our political system. But before we talk about that, I want to suggest that if you're liking this video, you'll probably also like a video that I made last year about how who owns the media affects what stories get reported on and how. And if you want the best experience for watching that video, then you'll want to do so on Nebula. Nebula is the streamy award-nominated streaming service created by a bunch of educational YouTubers and owned by those creators themselves, including me. It allows you to watch my videos with zero ads anywhere on the site, along with those of plenty of other creators that you already know and love. Once you've watched my video on media bias, for example, you'll probably want to check out Second Thought's videos on the topic. 
And then you'll likely want to watch Super Bunny Hop's video about media literacy and game news, which gives a really interesting behind the scenes insight into how news outlets decide what to report on. If you're interested in signing up for Nebula, then you'll want to know that the best way of doing so is through a partnership that we've put together with another streaming service called CuriosityStream. This allows you to get access to both platforms for less than $15 for an entire year. When Nebula is the home of all your favorite indie creators, CuriosityStream is chock full of big budget documentaries and non-fiction films. If you're actually interested in the future of Moon Settlement, for example, I really enjoyed Return to the Moon, which provides a great insight into what it will take to build moon colonies and how close to a reality that dream currently is. CuriosityStream and Nebula make for great companions to one another, and so we've partnered to put together a bundle deal in which signing up to both services is actually cheaper than signing up to either on its own. If you head to curiositystream.com forward slash Tom Nicholas, you can get 26% off the normal price of an annual Curiosity Stream subscription with Nebula thrown in for free. And by using that link to let them know that I sent you, you'll also be helping to support my channel and enabling me to continue to make videos like this one. Which we will return to right now. So, the story of the modern-day think tank begins in America, in 1916, with this brilliantly bearded fellow, Robert S. Brookings. Brookings was very much a Bill Gates or Michael Bloomberg of his day. He'd made his fortune manufacturing, transporting and selling wooden furniture. And he must have had a pretty good eye for dining room tables, because by the age of 47, he'd become so unbelievably wealthy that he was able to pack in his day job entirely and focus on the larger questions in life. Which, I mean, it's not like a businessman getting into politics has ever been a bad idea, is it? See, if you were a wealthy industrialist in turn-of-the-century America, then you were all about the two Ps – philanthropy and progressivism. By philanthropy, I of course mean sharing a portion of your wealth with honourable causes. This was the era of Carnegie and Rockefeller, both of whom loved to dish out cash in return for the modest gesture of having their names chiselled in massive letters on the side of a library or lecture theatre. By progressivism, I mean a new political philosophy that was taking the American elite by storm. Now, while related, it's important to say that the progressivism that gained traction at the beginning of the 20th century wasn't quite the same as what's sometimes referred to as progressivism in American political commentary today. These titans of industry weren't about to call for a Bernie Sanders-style political revolution. Instead, for rich folks, turn-of-the-century progressivism was all about taking a more evidence-based approach to politics. In an era of continuous labour disputes, strikes and lockouts, figures such as Robert S. Brookings felt that politics had grown too ideological, and that society would benefit, instead, from a more reasoned approach, which found solutions to society's ills in the then-blossoming field of economics and other social sciences. It was to this end that, in 1916, Brookings founded the Institute for Government Research. His goal was for this organisation to hire a ragtag bunch of economists and other social scientists to conduct studies and undertake research, which could then be shared with politicians and those who vote for them to help them make more informed, rational decisions. Again, allergic to what he thought of as ideological thinking, the Institute was to be, in Brookings' own words, free from any political or pecuniary interests and would simply lay before the country in a coherent form the fundamental economic facts, as objectively as possible. And in case anyone's worried that Brookings was being a little modest in his founding of the Institute for Government Research, fear not. He renamed it the Brookings Institution a few years later. 
Of course, it's important to acknowledge that this notion of being able to transcend ideology and enact a perfectly logical politics is a load of rubbish. As Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube highlights in her video on Jordan Peterson, what one considers to be ideological and what one views as just logical is itself informed by one's ideological view of the world. This is, in turn, often shaped by one's material interests. It speaks volumes, for instance, that the Brookings Institution was a committed opponent of the New Deal arguing instead that FDR should have responded to the Great Depression with the implementation of austerity measures. Nevertheless, there was clearly some degree of intellectual freedom at the Brookings Institution. In 1933, for example, one Brookings researcher wrote a paper which called for the nationalisation of the American coal industry which is unlikely to have been the natural political position of the institution's capitalist benefactor. Brookings' reputation for high-quality, independent research led to a small coterie of similar organisations popping up over the following decades. The National Bureau for Economic Research and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, for example, both similarly hired researchers to produce reports on economic trends and defence policy. In all honesty, these early think tanks were pretty boring. They largely consisted of a bunch of policy nerds sitting in offices, writing books and compiling studies that very few people actually read. Yet soon, all of that was to change. See, as the 20th century wore on, this brief trend among the super-rich for having a social conscience began to wane. The economic elite in both America and Europe increasingly began to embrace a politics of libertarianism, or what's now often called neoliberalism. These political philosophies viewed most state intervention in the economy, whether that be progressive taxation, the provision of unemployment benefits, or the requirement of workplaces to comply with health and safety regulations, as denying rich people their fundamental human right to get even richer. What they needed, however, was a way of making this clearly self-interested worldview palatable to the general public. A key figure in this campaign was a British businessman called Anthony Fisher. Fisher first became interested in neoliberal economics when he read an abridged version of Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom which is essentially the sacred text of people who like to shake their fists at big government. Fisher sought out Hayek at a public lecture at the London School of Economics and explained that the book had inspired him to embark upon a career as a politician. Hayek, however, convinced Fisher that he could have far more influence over politics by using his time and wealth to found a research institute devoted to producing evidence to support the implementation of right-wing policies. There were a handful of pre-existing organisations which Fisher was able to draw inspiration from when he founded the Institute of Economic Affairs in 1955. Since the mid-1940s, concerned groups of businessmen in the United States had begun to similarly fund so-called research organisations, which on the surface seemed similar enough to the bureaucratic offerings of the Brookings Institution. With names such as the American Enterprise Institute and the Foundation for Economic Education, they certainly sounded boring enough. Yet these organisations were driven by a far clearer political agenda. Their role was no longer to undertake research which could inform recommendations for political policy, but to pick a conservative, libertarian or otherwise right-wing policy their funders would want to see implemented, and then work backwards to piece together some research which showed that policy to be beneficial. Anthony Fisher's creation, the Institute of Economic Affairs, was an overwhelming success. Over the course of 20 years, it waged a quiet yet dedicated campaign to popularise free market economic ideas among both British politicians and those who voted for them. These efforts would pay off in 1979, when Margaret Thatcher was elected as Prime Minister and began to implement many of the IEA's favoured policies. 
Fisher was not content with influencing British politics, however. Spurred on by the victories of the IEA, he soon set about internationalising this model of propaganda with an academic facade, founding the Manhattan Institute in America, the Fraser Institute in Canada, and the Centre for Independent Studies in Australia. In fact, all in all, Fisher has been credited with contributing to the founding of 150 of these institutes across the globe all with the goal of providing advocates of unregulated capitalism with academic-sounding evidence to support their arguments. The most influential of what were slowly becoming known as think tanks in the United States, however, was not one of Fisher's. The Heritage Foundation was founded in 1973 with a donation of $250,000 from Joseph Kortz, then president of the Kors Brewing Company a position we can only assume that he obtained through merit. If Anthony Fisher established the model for the modern-day think tank, then the Heritage Foundation perfected it. The foundation did away with book-length studies and boring original research almost entirely, instead focusing on the publication and circulation of policy briefs. These consisted of super-short pamphlets containing uh, evidence to prove why a certain bill being considered by the US Congress was good or bad, and which would be distributed to politicians and journalists to try and shape the political and media conversation around that bill. Much like the Institute of Economic Affairs in the UK, the Heritage Foundation and other right-wing think tanks like it played a key role in popularising libertarian and neoliberal ideas among the American public. In doing so, they helped lay the groundwork for the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. As more and more businesses and rich folks began to donate greater and greater amounts of money to support their work, the Heritage Foundation also began to put pressure on politicians themselves. When Reagan first took office in 1981, Heritage presented his administration with a 3,000-page, 20-volume report called Mandate for Leadership which detailed all the policies that they thought he should implement. And it worked. By the end of Reagan's first term, he had enacted around half of the reforms that the Heritage Foundation had pushed for. While the first think tanks were founded with the intention of having at least a modicum of intellectual independence then, during the second half of the 20th century, they became increasingly partisan. Later organisations such as the Institute of Economic Affairs and the Heritage Foundation were able to draw upon the relatively good reputation of firms such as the Brookings Institution to dress up their propaganda as legitimate, serious research. One measure of the extent to which these organisations have managed to infiltrate our politics is the sheer number of think tanks that exist in the present day. Researcher Lynn Hellebust recalls that in 1945, there were just 62 think tanks in America. By the 1990s, she counted more than 1,200. Globally, a report published by researchers at the University of Pennsylvania in 2021 estimated that there were now 11,175 think tanks working to influence policy across the world. While this figure includes some organisations which lean towards more legitimate research activity, right-wing think tanks remain the most well-funded and thus the most influential. Many of these exist under the umbrella of the Atlas Network, an international organisation funded by the personal foundations of various right-wing billionaires, including Charles Koch, which provides grants and training to more than 500 think tanks which push for the adoption of libertarian and neoliberal policies across the globe. While we've already touched upon a few ways in which think tanks manage to achieve this end, however, I want to continue by focusing more explicitly on some of the tactics which these fake research institutes use to influence which political policies get passed and which get ridiculed as extreme or unworkable. In doing so, we're going to take a look at a few concrete examples of think tanks shaping how certain topics get talked about in the media, 
as well as thinking about how all of this might give us a slightly different perspective on that debate surrounding the so-called privatization of the moon. As we saw towards the end of the previous section, one way in which think tanks work to influence what political policies get passed is through directly engaging with politicians. This might include a whole range of activities, from simply sending them a briefing document which encourages them to support or oppose a certain bill, right up to writing entire drafts of proposed legislation. This is something that has been repeatedly evident during the process of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. When, in 2018, it appeared that parliamentary deadlock might lead to the passing of a compromisory deal in which the UK would have continued to have had some regulatory alignment with the EU on trade, the Institute of Economic Affairs worked with more hardcore Brexiteers in Parliament to launch their own proposed deal document called Plan A+. The writing of the IEA's proposed deal was supported by a grant from the Atlas Network and was, unsurprisingly, a libertarian's dream, with provisions that would have essentially abolished the National Health Service in favour of privatised healthcare. In fact, the publication of this document ended up causing some problems for the Institute. See, most think tanks in the UK and the US and likely elsewhere are non-profits or charities. And legally, this means that they have to retain some level of plausible deniability about their political allegiances. They're not propaganda outlets, they're just educators who just happen to always end up educating people that privatisation and low taxes for billionaires are good. The Heritage Foundation in America, for example, includes a disclaimer at the bottom of all of their policy reports which states that Nothing written here is to be construed as necessarily reflecting the views of the Heritage Foundation, or as an attempt to aid or hinder the passage of any bill before Congress. Which is particularly funny when it's printed on the bottom of reports called things like, Is Social Security Worth Its Cost? So obvious were the Institute of Economic Affairs' attempts to influence the Brexit process, however, that it ended up being issued with a formal warning by the UK Charity Commission. A warning that the Commission then withdrew when it was pointed out that if it was going to criticise the IEA for undertaking political activities, then it would probably have to also criticise every other think tank and... I guess that was a can of worms it was just easier not to open. All of this, however, is a far cry from the debate about moon privatisation that I discussed at the beginning of this video. For while well, the publication of the paper that started that debate probably didn't go nearly as well as the Adam Smith Institute had hoped, it's unlikely that they ever thought that it was going to lead to the immediate adoption by the UK government of policies which would allow Elon Musk to become custodian of the moon. Instead, the release of that paper was part of the other side to the work of think tanks. Influencing the way in which we talk about politics through the sustained manipulation of the media. One way in which think tanks achieve this is by intervening in already ongoing political debates through arranging media appearances for their so-called researchers. Whenever a proposed political policy is being discussed on the news, think tanks will work hard to ensure that a member of their staff is present to put across the views of their employer. Take this recent clip from the BBC News Channel, in which the topic being discussed was the UK government's plans to forcibly migrate asylum seekers to Rwanda. This is an initiative which has been widely condemned as inhumane and cruel by human rights groups. Nevertheless, in their reporting on the topic, the BBC chose to bring on a guy called Sam Armstrong, who worked for a think tank called the Henry Jackson Society. To the average viewer, the Henry Jackson Society likely sounds like a legitimate research institution. By extension, most people will assume Armstrong to be a qualified expert on the topic of immigration. In reality, the Henry Jackson Society is an organisation which essentially exists to promote Islamophobia in British society. 
Its most famous alumnus is Douglas Murray, whose book The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity and Islam was described by The Guardian as an attenuated version of the Great Replacement Theory for the Telegraph Reading Classes. Like the Adam Smith Institute, the Henry Jackson Society is deeply secretive about who funds it. Yet researchers at the University of Bath have identified as one of its largest donors, Stanley Carr a former businessman and Conservative Party activist who later switched his allegiance to Nigel Farage's far-right UK Independence Party. In 2020, it was also revealed that the Henry Jackson Society had received £80,000 from the Home Office itself. That's the body which is in charge of UK immigration policy. Far from some independent immigration expert then, Armstrong, himself a former Conservative Party activist, is little more than a propagandist. Given that the organisation that pays his salary has received funding from the very same government body that is responsible for conceiving of the policy that he was invited onto the BBC to discuss, it's little surprise that he chose to argue that the forced migration of vulnerable people is a great thing, actually. Figures from think tanks are constantly called upon to contribute quotes to articles or appear on the news, with little time or space given to the matter of who funds their operations. This is partly the result of naivety on the part of journalists, but it's largely down to how sophisticated think tanks are at playing the media game. See, if you're a television producer trying to book guests, then identifying actual experts and persuading them to come onto your show is difficult and time-consuming. Most university professors, for example, don't have full-time publicists, and many don't even know how their webcams work. Contrast this with the Adam Smith Institute, which has a mobile number on the bottom of its website which encourages journalists and producers to contact 24 hours a day. If you need a guest quickly, it's clear who you're going to get in touch with. In their efforts to manipulate our political discourse, however, most think tanks are far more ambitious than simply wanting to respond to whatever the topic of the day is. As we saw in the case of the Heritage Foundation in the previous section, most of these fake research institutes are willing to put in the far longer term work to change public attitudes about certain issues. One good example of this relates to the welfare state. If you've ever gotten into an argument with someone about whether the government should give support to people who are low paid, unemployed or unable to work, then they might have raised the concept of welfare dependency which, as the UK-based Centre for Policy Studies puts it, is an economically destructive phenomenon which reduces the incentive to work and earn more whilst keeping people trapped in a cycle of low aspirations, low productivity and low pay. The argument is essentially that if you're too generous with state benefits, then people will become over-reliant on that money to the point where it kills off their drive to ever find work or better paid work. This idea of welfare dependency is so widespread in debates surrounding social security that one would assume that it stems from some highly revered study. But this is not the case. In fact, the idea that one can become dependent on state welfare was first blasted into the mainstream in its contemporary form by this guy. Charles Murray. Now, if you've heard of Charles Murray, it's probably for his co-authorship of the 1994 book The Bell Curve, which famously suggests that differential outcomes between black and white Americans are not the result of structural racism, but instead of genetically determined differences in intelligence between those two groups. Sean's got a really good video debunking all of that. What you might not know is that Murray is a think tank guy through and through. He currently works for the American Enterprise Institute, but spent much of his career at the billionaire-funded Manhattan Institute. In fact, it was the Manhattan Institute that funded the writing of Murray's first book, Losing Ground, which argued that the advent of welfare programs for the poor had made it profitable for the poor to behave in the short term in ways that were destructive in the long term. 
Murray concluded that the only way to combat what he saw as a growing dependency among poor people on handouts from the state was to scrap the entire federal welfare and income support structure for working-aged persons, including aid to families with dependent children, Medicaid, food stamps, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, subsidised housing, disability insurance, and the rest. Despite losing ground being panned by academic sociologists and economists who criticised it as a shoddy, politically motivated piece of research, the media-savvy Manhattan Institute was able to use the book as the basis for starting a debate in the media about the efficacy of social security programmes. Armed with this concept of welfare dependency, it was suddenly possible for those arguing for the complete abolition of government support for society's most vulnerable to portray themselves as benevolent saviours who simply wanted to defend the poor from being coddled by the state. In fact, the end result of the reframing of the welfare state which Murray began is not to be found, as one might assume, in the cuts to social security programmes enacted by Ronald Reagan. Reagan was quite happy to demonise the poor with tropes such as that of the welfare queen. Where we really see the impact of losing ground is in the reforms of Bill Clinton ten years later. For so normalised had this view of the welfare state as a hindrance rather than a help to those who received it become that Clinton was able to declare that he was going to end welfare as we know it with pride and position his cutting of financial support to poor, unemployed mothers as a compassionate act. The real power of think tanks then and the reason that the super-rich and large corporations divert significant sums of money to funding them is their ability to, through sustained effort over whole decades, change the terms of political debate. Through pumping out questionable research, think tanks are able to make the self-interested policy demands of the elite appear to be grounded in evidence and they are able to use their skill at manipulating the media to push those ideas on the general public. Through this process, actions which at one point might have been seen as shocking, such as a society refusing to provide assistance to its poorest members, come to be seen as common sense. All of which brings us back to the Adam Smith Institute and their proposal to give billionaires dominion over the moon. So, I think there's a bunch of potential explanations for what the Adam Smith Institute's intentions were in trying to promote this idea that we urgently need to establish a system of private property rights on the moon. Judging by how much of the paper is spent, not actually discussing the moon at all, but instead introducing the reader to John Locke's moral justification for the establishment of private property rights more broadly, it's possibly just a bait and switch, in which the Institute is using the sexy topic of commercial space activity as an excuse to talk about how great the private ownership of natural resources is. Or maybe this is the beginning of a prolonged campaign to try and get the voting public on side with the idea of Jeff Bezos building a golf course on the moon. Unsurprisingly, given who published it, if you go away and read the paper itself, you'll most likely be massively underwhelmed. It's more of an extended think piece than a rigorous examination of space law, and the author, Rebecca Lowe, is forced to admit within it that her proposals are completely unworkable in the absence of an internationally recognised model for setting and enforcing laws in outer space. It certainly seems unlikely that this research would be deemed diligent enough to withstand a peer review process. As I mentioned earlier, it's safe to say that the launch of this paper probably didn't go quite the way that the Adam Smith Institute had hoped. In fact, with all the hatred that the idea attracted, we could say that it went about as well as a SpaceX rocket launch. 
And yet, despite the mediocrity of the research paper itself and the organisation which was publishing it, having an established history of releasing shoddy work that solely serves the interests of its corporate funders, it still made headlines. At a time when energy bills, rents and inflation were on the rise, it led to many hours of human thought and labour being wasted on a conversation about something as remote to most of our lives as moon law. Which goes to show that even when things don't go exactly to plan, think tanks retain an ability to set the terms of our political debate, to use their considerable resources to shape the new forcing everyone else into a position where they can only respond. In fact, while I was researching this video, I gradually realised that another news event of the past 18 months is entirely the work of right-wing think tanks. The present moral panic amongst American conservatives surrounding critical race theory can entirely be laid at the feet of a network of such organisations in the United States, who have not only worked to promote this confected outrage, but in their nurturing of the man who has been its biggest proponent, Christopher F. Rufo, were essential to giving it a degree of credibility in the first place. I was going to include a discussion of critical race theory in this video, but the resulting script ended up sounding a bit like two very distinct different videos had sort of had a car crash. So if you'd like to see a sequel to this video in which I do discuss that, then let me know. Otherwise, next time you're reading the newspaper or watching the news, take a closer look at who's being quoted or interviewed. Because Whilst expertise can be something to be celebrated, not all experts are created equal. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. I hope that it's been worthy of your time. If you have any friends, either online or off, who you think also might be interested in it, then I would be super grateful if you would consider sharing it with them. Thank you, as ever, to Richard, Sindri Nielsen, Kaya Lau, David Brothers, Alan Gann, Luke Meyer, Gary, Dickon Spain, Bill Mitchell, Al Zweigart, ZC Reese, Shab Kumar, Anil, Alexander Blank, Neil Zabildgard, Sophia R, President Dwayne Elizondo, Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho, Sergio Suarez, Alexandra McGuinness Wartendike, Nicholas Jacquemart, Strange Weekend, Ricardo Fernandez de Cordoba, Richard Rapoon, Udo, Dan Gittick, Elliot Day, Malik Hamidi, Carl Eric Patrick Iwerson, Samantha Varma and Amit Singh Parahar for being signed up to the top tier of my Patreon. If you would like to join them in getting early access to videos, copies of the scripts to them and more, then you can find out how to do so at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thank you once again for watching and have a fantastic week.